Welcome back to the Capacity Capitalist Show. So depending on where you fall in the innovation wheelhouse, we'll, we will have something that will inform and inspire you today, my kind listeners out there, my gentle listeners. Thank you so much for tuning in. My Yes, John Gossier is a is as well known in the tech fine fintech space as he is in the film finance space. That is unlikely combination for most young entrepreneurs that have this starry eye of building up a company to one day sale and pocket millions in return for their innovation and hard work. And sometimes they become angel investors or jump right into the venture capital pool which you will hear shortly, that is exactly what John did. But then they go a step further, which is not the unusual. They direct their funding ambitions into an area that is an industry they have a passion for, and in many ways, maybe uncharted territory. But by doing so, they pave the way for others to follow into a, and a whole industry has a potential to be lifted up. And for John, that has been the film industry. Georgia enacted a generous tax credit beginning in 2008. Today, it has nearly a $3 billion economic impact. That's more than professional sports or college sports events, even the MLB All-Star or the the Final Four bring to Georgia. And with the advent of big studios that produce Marvel movie blockbusters, of course, Tarla Perry's long history and franchise of key TV series and the films and film series. Georgia has become only second to California in their production of movie blockbusters. Pre-COVID, yet a big challenge as the tax credit has evolved, has been to build out a 365-day-a-year industry that is supported by skilled job creation across the board with the reward of successful film, TV, and even the gaming and music aspects of all that the entertainment for the fruits of those successes to be realized by investing in Georgia as well. So, in fact, John's alma mater, Savannah, excuse me, I'm stumbling here, Savannah College of Art and Design, commonly known or referred to as SCAD, they expanded their film art tech school that is now the largest, most comprehensive university film studio complex in the nation. John has had a fascinating journey from this SCAD grad that focused on the music industry to becoming named one of tech's, uh, one of the named one to watch in the new faces of black leadership by Time Magazine and originating in his early tech entrepreneur days, co-founding companies such as Afro Labs, uh, that was a network and tech innovation hub that now reaches 90 plus cities, Africa, which is a tech consulting firm that serves Google, Facebook, and Twitter, and out of his experience working in crisis response and counterintelligence in East Africa, even being lauded by the White House, to then launch Audigent, a a data platform for audience engagement analytics for the music industry, recently named one of the fastest growing tech companies in the country by Inc. 5000 and Deloitte. So what problem did he tackle next? Well, he said it best in his interview in Deadline, and I quote John here, Everyone talks about the films that shoot in Georgia, but where does the money come from? Almost always from L.A. and New York and London, somewhere else. So he started seeding it himself with his own money, Film Hedge, with $100 million under management. And he'll probably correct me if on that number might have changed. They have become one of the few groups capable of greenlighting films from Georgia and Southbox Entertainment with $80 million in fresh funds that offer a different film finance model. I mean, wow, John, welcome, welcome. I feel like I should have a little drum roll here. I mean, all of this just since 2005, right? When you were the music supervisor working on Perry's first film, The Diary of a Mad Black Woman. And yeah, you really- I, I worked on that as uh, as an assistant engineer, basically a glorified intern. And then about oh. a year later, he hired me at Tyler Perry Studios to become um the head of uh, one of the heads of the audio department there. So uh, really enjoyed working with Tyler. Oh yeah. I, I can only imagine. So, so he help it connect the dots here. What you, you went to school uh, working on music engineering. What made you, how did you go from that? When did you decide to go into tech itself and start a tech startup and not just go work for, you know, some tech company? Well, it's 
kind of a long story that it may not make sense, but I'll abbreviate it. So I started off in, I started off wanting to make comic books actually. And I studied what's called sequential art. And sequential art is the, uh, in the film industry is the same thing known as uh, storyboarding. And so as part of uh, the, that program, you learn a lot about film so that you can do storyboards for a film. And then while in school, I just kind of fell in love with all these other areas of film. So uh, directing, you know, photography, and then also sound and audio. And so when I got out of school, I realized I knew pretty much how to make a movie from soup to nuts, from camera to script. Um, but none of that is useful if you don't have money. And they teach you how to do everything in film school except for how to finance a film. Yeah. And so when I got out of school, I um, realized that I wasn't, you know, I didn't have any indication that um, I was some great director. I didn't have any indication that uh, somebody was going to give me a big bunch, a bunch of money to make movies. And so, you know, what could I do to make money coming out of school? Well, I had transferable skills that, uh, you know, and people have to remember, this is back when there was no film anything in Georgia. This was pre-tax credit, pre-Tyler Perry, pre-everything. This is back in 2001, 2002. Oh, and right, 2008, right? I think I said that at the top. It was when the yeah, film tax Yeah, that's when the tax started. credit came, 2008. But I got out of college around 2002. So wow. uh, there was nothing here. It was a wasteland for film and TV. So instead, uh, what was booming here? Music. And so mm -hmm. when you learn film, you learn all the different parts of uh, uh, audio because you have to do every film has audio. So I learned a lot about recording studios and I ended up getting jobs in recording studios right out of school. And it was in one of those recording studios that I met Tyler Perry, who happened to bring his first movie, Diary of, Diary of a Mad Black Woman, which you just said, to our stu uh, studio. And he wanted us to do the, the sound for it. Um, and so I worked on that. That ended up being my first film as well as his first film. And um, long story short, that led to my career working at TPS as one of the first employees. Tyler Perry Studios is one of the first employees. I did all the laugh tracks. I did sound for movies and TV shows. And I did a lot of the music uh, for those uh, shows. And um, I just realized I didn't like being a creative for hire, right? Like if you're creative, you want to make your art. I don't want to, I didn't want to work on other people's art. I wanted to make my own thing. Uh, and so I just decided my other love was uh, tech. I had always been a self-taught programmer and wow. hobbyist. And so um, I quit and started a software company and never looked back. It didn't work out right away, but I persevered and eventually it did. Okay, so there's um to so uh, get digging into some of that a bit of that origin because you know it's clear like why mod music was a logical choice there, and uh, how how did you end up over in East Africa? A girl. <laughs> oh, so, okay. So uh, the girl I was dating at the time, uh, she got a job uh, that required her to be the head of this. Well, she was the head of this like. NGO, basically a charity, and uh, they did water projects around Africa for, you know, uh, impoverished people, and um, and uh, they, the job required her to, it was a very senior job, but it required her to be based on the African continent, yeah. and their headquarters was in Uganda, and so I moved with her. I didn't really have a reason to go other than that, but I did have a love of travel, and I had a love for the unknown. And so um, it was right around the time that, in fact, I was working at Tyler Perry Studios for about six months before they realized I had moved to another co a continent. And <laughs> because they were in such a rapid growth phase yeah. back then that the, a lot of stuff slipped through the cracks. Uh, I did tell them that I left. They, for whatever reason, they didn't notice. And, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that's how I ended up there. And then I just by coincidence started, um, you know, my software company and ended up at the time becoming one of the more prominent known um, African tech companies of that era. This is now 2008, 2009. Uh, I was in Africa from 2008 to 2011. Okay. So, you know, there's a, a lot of talk right now. It's in the news and really ever since the uh, 
the Angel Network and VC Industries had their wake up call in 2020 about how diverse founders get less than, you know, combining women and uh, people of color. What probably back then it was like less than six percent or nine percent. You know, now it's definitely less than six percent. Whatever it's it's changed, but uh, the uh, we're so and even the assault. I'm sure you're you're highly aware of it because it's it's big in the in our local VC community, Fearless Fund, and the attack on them for their business model and helping women of color get seed financing. Did you build those initial successful companies, Afro Labs and Africa? bootstrapped or at one point did you bring in outside capital did you do it just based on you know growing it the best way through customer revenue or did you end up having outside financial partners on those so building a company in africa as you can imagine there's not uh especially back then in 2008 uh, when I first got there there wasn't a vc scene like africa is now very popular with vcs uh, it's particularly fintech VCs. Um, there's been a couple of unicorns that have emerged from Africa, and there's been a couple of exits. Uh, but back then, it was like nothing. <laughs> so um, I didn't have the luxury of raising venture capital. Um, and that company is a consultancy. It's not a product-based oh. uh, company. It's not a the, the company Africa. Um, and we, um, but we were for profit. We weren't a nonprofit. And I did, I did a non, I did a for profit because. I was like, well, why can't high growth tech companies emerge from Africa? And so we basically had to bootstrap. I was very fortunate in that I moved there right when Google was about a decade old. Twitter was, uh, you know, a startup. It was maybe like one or two years old. Facebook was, you know, two or three years old. And they were all trying to figure out Africa because when you've already dominated the rest of the world, where do you yeah. go for new audience? It was Latin America, it was Africa, it was Asia. And so I happened to be in Africa at a time where they needed local partners. And so I became their local partner. Oh, good. Yeah. A lot of so it's interesting how much is uh, timing, right? So how did that parlay into Autogen? So um, I realized very early on the difference between a product company and a uh, consultancy. Um, the thing about... Um, the reason why people love the tech industry is because you can start a high growth tech company. It can grow and it can sell for multiples on revenue or, you know, multiples of something. Um, whereas if you have a consultancy, you basically have to work there forever and maybe you can sell it uh, for someone who wants your clients, but there's no like products that someone is buying that they can easily just turn key, uh, acquire and then apply to their own industry um, or business. And, um, so what I ended up doing is I left my African companies to the African because I was like, I'm, yeah. I didn't sign up to be here forever. And I don't, I, I can't run these companies from America. So I had good staff. I left those companies to them. There's uh, uh, three or four companies that I started in addition to, to Africa. And those are, uh, for the most part, those are all still running, thriving, doing well now, 13 years later. Yeah. Um, but at the time, I was like, well, what do I want to do instead? And what I had learned working with African tech companies and investors and uh, and enterprise companies and also these big tech companies that were coming in Africa, I started to learn about venture capital, tech, angel investors, et cetera. So I was like, why don't I go back to America and start a company where people can back me in that way? And so I started a company called MetaLayer which was solving the data problems that I learned about in these big tech companies. So one thing that I learned working with them is not everyone at Google or Twitter or Facebook is a genius computer scientist, you know, wizard. A lot of them are non-technical and a lot of them were struggling keeping up with their technical counterparts when it came to working on the same uh, data sets or problems. And so I tried to build this platform or we built this platform that, um, made it easy for non-technical people to work with very complex data sets. Um, and then I sold that company two years later. Um, and coming out of that exit, I was uh, aware of another problem I had learned about working with big tech, which is what is all of their business models? They make money, they not, people say advertising. It's not really advertising. 
uh, Google, Facebook, and Twitter make money by giving ad advertisers access in real time to their audiences at scale across the internet. So it's like, it's not the, 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 the advertising isn't the, the sort of driver, it's the, the pipes that deliver the ads to people. Like when you get a pop-up ad or when you get a, a keyword on your search thing, you know, people are, you know, there's, those are real time transactions happening at fractions of a second, like the stock market that add, add up to uh, billions of dollars a day millions of dollars a year exchange between advertisers, website owners, and then who sits in the middle? Mostly Google. And so that's where the, all that money comes from. And so I was like, hmm, I used to be in the music industry and everybody complained about not having money. Why don't they just do this? And uh, so I built a company that took the pipe part of that whole business model. The, you know, the, 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 the technology that delivers the ads to people based on demographics, psychographics, location, IP address, all that stuff. We built an, essentially an ad exchange that traded, that helped the music industry own that data. But the real innovation there was, um, we did it based on what people listen to on Spotify, Tidal, YouTube. And so that became the signal that we sold to advertisers. We would say like, hey, this is a, a Taylor Swift fan, or this is a Beyonce fan, or this is a, Bruno Mars fan and different advertisers would pay to reach those audiences, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you were doing the catalog. The catalog was the was the artist that would fit a demographic and then you delivered the ads. So you were the in between. Well, we, yeah, we delivered the data to the advertisers so they could reach the right people in the right moment based okay. on their music listening habits, based on their preferences uh you know because music is is kind of like a signal for what your t tastes are right and so yeah. i might be a jay-z fan i might be a taylor swift fan i might be a, a rascal flats fan right that's a very specific mix of music and that means if you can figure out what that person likes you can target ads to them that are going to be you know personalized that are going to be relevant and that are going to compel them to click, which is what advertisers care about, versus just saying like, oh, this is a hip hop fan. Because lots of hip hop fans are also country fans. Lots of country fans also like techno. So, you know, basically we operated off the belief that uh, trying to define individuals by music genres was stupid. And you should just look at what they're actually listening to. Okay, cool. Because that's, uh... so, has it advanced just like on an aside, but I uh, just, cause I'm curious about this. So has it advanced so that the, like when I get at, like, uh, like for example, uh, on one music platform, I'm a freebie on another music platform. I'm, I pay. Right. And so one, I get all the, I get ads to me. It's like listening to the radio. I never really, I, and I actually, you know, oh, that's an interesting ad. Like I don't mind listening to the ads. So are they delivering ads in my listening stream that have been customized to me? Has the technology gotten that much? Or are they just doing it at that time of day on that type of stream on that channel? And it's not, have they have the actual players gotten that sophisticated? It's way more sophisticated than that. In fact, it has nothing. The ads are not heard. So that you won't know that the advertisers have targeted you based on what you listen to. It just becomes a data signal that they buy and then they deliver the ad somewhere else. So for instance, you might uh, go oh, okay. home to your smart TV and open up you know, CNN and you might get an ad and that ad has been personalized based on data that was sold to someone somewhere. And um, somewhere in that data set, it might say, this is Karen Rand, she likes whatever music you listen to. Um, here's what we think we know about her. And that's okay. why that ad is being delivered to you. So anywhere you are touching a digital device is where the ads would show up. Okay. Where we were getting our data that made us different was we weren't getting it from websites and from your email yeah. and from we were getting it from streaming platforms and social media. So you're adding those that musical preference of the st on the streaming platforms into the digital Chrome trail. That's exactly right. And okay. so you can yeah, imagine. Wow. So okay, so no wonder you were able to seed start your own film fund. <laughs> film, <laughs> yeah. Film so that company would, so you can imagine 
we, we, I always used to say to people in the music industry, we, oh, and here's another thing that we did. We did this on behalf, uh, at first on behalf of the recording artist. So we were like, hey, Taylor Swift, why are you, you know, you're making money from your tours, you're making money from your music, you're making money from your uh, merchandise. Why is it when Coca-Cola wants to reach millions of Taylor Swift fans across the internet, they pay Google and not you? And so what we represented was the Taylor Swifts of the world on the ad exchanges. So they could buy the data directly from the artists. The artists didn't understand what we were talking about. All of them said no and laughed us out of the room. Um, and so we kept at it. And eventually the record labels figured out what we were doing. And they were like, wow, if this works, this is like, you're gonna be making Google money for music, you know, music artists. And if they make Google money, they don't need us because they'll be able to fund themselves. So uh, uh, Warner uh, Media recognized that this could be a really massively disruptive company and kill their music business. So uh, they did the, instead of suing us, they, uh, they invested and they basically put in a bunch of people, controlled the company and then grew it. Um, and then they broke their deals with all the other major record labels, Universal, Sony, uh, ASCAP, BMI, and CESAC. And so we, like, Autogen is sort of like part of the music industry infrastructure. It was incredibly disruptive and it's, uh, you know, pretty massive company uh, today. But I, I took a buyout in 2017 and I have watched the company grow and flourish, uh, flourish since then. Okay, so... So let's talk uh, just for the finishing up the tech side of the conversation for our listeners. So that so Autogen was your one company that you built up because it was a tech company to sell. Is that right? Is that the only um, acquisition that you've had? Yeah, it's uh, the second acquisition that I've had. Okay. The first so, one was Metalayer. Oh, right. The okay. Data company. Yeah. So how do you how did you know when it was right to sell? Did you start out building them with that end game? Like I, you know, I want to go from here to Toledo, and Toledo is my I'm selling the company. So I this is my best way of getting there. Or were you just I hope I build something and I don't know where it's going to go? Talk a little bit about your vision, and then when did you know was the right time? Yeah, so uh, number one, I really love that analogy from here to Toledo. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> like, uh, Toledo being the exit of a tech company. But I, I would say most, it, so I've done a couple of tech companies. It's always the, the uh, latter in that I never know where they're going. Um, I know that the possibility of an exit exists. I also know the possibility of going public exists. I know the possibility of complete total failure exists, but I just start and I try to solve the problem and then figure out what, which way I'm headed, which, which part of Toledo I'm headed to um, uh, based on how it goes building the business. Because first you've got to prove you can solve the problem and then you've got to prove that you can scale the solution. Yeah, because there's, right. a lot of, there's a lot of businesses that solve problems, but they're very like, small business opportunities. That's the opposite of scale. Like the reason why venture capital exists and the reason why a lot of founders get frustrated with VCs is VCs don't always see where your scalable business opportunity is. They, they, you know, they look at a business and they're like, oh, that's cool. Maybe you'll get, you know, a thousand users. Most VCs won't get out of bed unless you're talking about hundreds of thousands of users or millions of users. So anything less than that, they're like, oh, that's nice. That's what they call a lifestyle business. They can support you and your friends and you can have a great lifestyle, but um, it's not going to be a, a huge hockey stick, uh, exponential growth kind of thing like Facebook was in its early days or Uber or Airbnb. Those are the type of businesses that um, uh, VCs look for. And it's not because they're of the industry that they're in. It's because they can see the scalable model. Okay. Yeah, and then I think the kind of the the other side of the coin of that is on the angel investor side, which is you know a big part of what I do with the education I offer to teach people how to be an angel investors, and of course my book Inside Secrets to Angel Investing, you know, is all the real basic fundamentals. But the big step is 
if it's a, and I have a whole section like lifestyle versus market maker, you know what I mean? Yeah. And identifying market participant, I call them, which ends up yeah. being lifestyle versus market maker and understanding that, that impact that they're going to have to disrupt or whatever. And do they have the ability because the million dollars or 2 million they raise in their angel round is never going to be enough to get to a company that can scale as big enough to be sold for a hundred million dollars or $50 million. It's, it's just, it just mathematically, right. You know what I mean? It's got to, <laughs> yeah, it's got to be able to. And so where is there, is this the kind of company that a VC or there's going to get the next round of finance is going to come in? Cause, and it's so many times I think angels miss that point. And that's why they get stuck with this portfolio of the Midlands that are in the middle that like, you know, they're uh, that's just another good one. Uh, the Midlands. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and when I was in venture capital, we used to call them zombie companies, which is they're making money. They have great people behind them. They are, you know, probably great ideas, but they neither flame out and die, but they also never really grow. Uh, and yeah. they also can't ever raise money. So they're just making money or, you know, off their customers and then they just exist forever. Yeah, I have a, a good a good friend, uh, uh, investor, uh, and I always have to give him credit, uh, Hall Martin out of Texas. Uh, he started CTAM originally, and he that runs another angel investor group now. And he calls it the payroll exit because they come to the board of angels and ask for a pay raise. And right. he's like, you guys, because they're they've shifted into this life. They want more money because now they got kids or whatever, yeah. right? He says, but I'm the investor that's sitting here with no exit. And right. so, you know, you're happy because you're making more money, but I need where am I going to get my exit? Right. And so, I mean, that's a different problem that I solve for those kind of companies. I have a solution for that that I won't go into right now because that's not what the purpose of this. So let's talk about film finance. Uh, did you know all along when you were, you know, solving this problem is like someday when I grow up, I want to be in the business of, of being a player to finance films. If I ever become, if I win the lottery or I build that successful tech company that makes a gazillion dollars, I, that's what I'm going to do. Did you know that or did, how did you get into this idea of film finance? So I did not know that. I, what I did know is that I love film and I love storytelling and I knew I wanted to be a part of that. Um, and that's something I wanted since I was really young. You know, uh, I mean, first it was comic books, but really comic books, what's dominating cinema right now is, is, is comic movies. Um, and so I knew I wanted to be part of storytelling. I like to write. I like to um, uh, come up with ideas and so forth. And um, what I would say is that uh, what drove me down to what I'm doing now is I, that a question that I had when I got out of school, which is I want to make movies. The one part I can't figure out is the finance part. And one thing that I've gotten really good at is if I, if there's like a roadblock or if there's something that I don't understand, I just obsess over it. And um, something I learned in the tech industry was uh, the best businesses start with a founder who's obsessed with a problem, not a solution, right? Like if you're obsessed with the problem, until that problem goes away, you will never stop coming up with innovative ideas and creative ways of addressing that thing. But if you focus on the solution, sometimes you might not have solved the problem. Maybe you build a great business, but that problem is still there. Um, and I think for a lot of businesses that don't make it, they are very solution focus, the solution obsessed instead of problem obsessed. So we earlier we were talking about this lack of knowledge in the industry about how films actually get financed and, and like a lot of the 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 people that become part of the production team or whatever in this this or that capacity you know they're kind of siloed and they don't understand it themselves even though they're in the industry and, um, you know, it's kind of like I, I have struggled with it as I've been trying to navigate through what is what is a producer? What's an executive producer? What does you know, like, do they you know, are that just money or do they actually know how films are made or, you know, all that kind of stuff. So break it down if you can in the time that we have left on, you know, sort of the the stage and how that how that finance because a big part you have two funds. One are both uh, both of them. One's equity and one's debt, right? And so, yeah. 
how do where does the equity play where does the debt play do they are they always a part of any balance sheet if you will of a of a film companies have balance sheets films don't really have balance sheets necessarily till later into it when they're first starting out they don't really think about debt because they don't think they have anything to finance so for our audience that's that's unfamiliar with this and particularly for investors that you know, see that there, because there is always an emotional connection. I think there's a lot of people that go, Ooh, wouldn't it be nice to be a person that had financed a film and be walking on the, you know, red carpet. And like I said, they know nothing. And I hear sometimes about movies that get funded by, because somebody wanted their daughter to have a cameo place in it. So, I mean, that's just, you know, that's kind of storybook stuff. So what's the real world of getting a film financed and, and at different stages of, of do they have to bootstrap it, if you will, to get all the way through the script writing and, and you know, producers or directors attached before any funding source will pay attention to them? Weird, because there's a lot of misinformation out there. So what I would uh, say is that there's, uh, you use uh, uh, the analogy of like, uh, films don't have balance sheets like uh, a startup or a small business would. This is because films are not really like startups or small businesses um, in the way that they come about and then they, they they get made. They're more like real estate. It's more like building a house okay. or a building. Um, and meaning that you, um, the, the IP, the idea of this, of the story and the script and all the creative stuff that is ultimately the building that you're building. That's That will be the asset. However, you need to go through steps to get that building built. Like, right, with a, a, a with a, if you're building a house, you've got to get, you know, um, a developer involved. Yeah. Well, you've got to get an architect involved. You've got to get a developer involved. You've got to, uh, if you're going to sell it to a consumer, you've got to get a mortgage company involved. So there's all of these other uh, sort of entities in the film industry that people outside the industry aren't thinking about when they think about making a movie. Most people, when they think about making a movie, is they're like, I've got a great idea for a script. Someone should give me a bunch of money. I'm going to you know, hire a bunch of people. We're going to make this movie. What they don't realize is, number one, you can go to, you can start at the end and work backwards. What do I mean by that? You can have a great script and a great concept and you can have no money. But you can go to a group like Netflix or Amazon or Disney or Fox or whoever. You can say, like, here's my story. The old model was give me a bunch of money, Mr. Studio person or Mrs. Studio person. And then you guys have, since you have all the money and all the power, you'll make this movie for me. And that, you know, and that it was kind of like old Hollywood. New Hollywood uh, producers will go there. And because they want to retain control of their creative IP, and because they want to uh, keep the economics, they want to have more upside on their film, um, they will uh, do what's called a negative pickup deal, where you have the deal with the buyer of the film before you've made it. And the reason why a Netflix would do that is because they know, they're like, we love this script. If you make this movie without us and you bring it to us after you're done, we might have to bid for it against all our competitors. So why don't we just do a deal with you now? There's no money changing hands, it's just paper, but it's a binding contract to buy that film. It's like a purchase order. And then they can come to a group like Film Hedge and we will advance money against that corporate uh, uh, paper, which because it's acting like a purchase order. So we secure against it, we're a lender. We basically say like, okay, this is our corporate paper now. Here's some money filmmaker, make the movie. And when you deliver it, we'll get paid back interest on our loan. Does that make sense? So that's what Film Hedge does. That's how films get debt financed. I don't want to get into the weeds on all the rest because I know we don't have a lot of time. But um, in order for that to work, films have to already be pretty far along. This is why uh, we, uh, you know, Film Hedge has been called uh, the fastest growing lender to Hollywood because we are. And because we aren't talking about you know, unknown filmmakers making, you know, $500,000 films. The average film for us um, on the low end is $5 million, $35 million on the high end. Average check for us is $8 million uh, and $20 million on the high end. 
So we are doing major movies that you would see in theaters, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, all those platforms. Um, all the biggest actors and talent that you can think of, they have, uh, their projects have flowed through the Film Edge platform. Um, what is, uh, so? but that means those films have to be pretty well established. They have to have money. They have to have uh, uh, some sort of connections to get all the parts in place before Film Hedge can even look at them. And so Film Hedge is not a solution for, for early stage filmmakers. And so uh, I knew that, and at, you know, three years into Film Hedge, um, I realized that there was an opportunity to create a different financial product for all those films that are earlier, that don't have the talent yet, that don't have the, uh, um, the, all these different parties involved in their film and who are trying to get there. And so we created Southbox. And Southbox is uh, more or less an equity financier. It's the first money committed to a film or TV show. We come in, uh, we, before we put in a dime, like we commit the money, but before we put in a, a dime, our team comes in and we make sure that everything is financially figured out around the production. That way we can then take it to our other company, Film Hedge, and finance it. And so between the two of them, we've got, uh, you know, they're both financing film and TV, but in different ways and for different reasons. So uh, um, Southbox helps filmmakers get started, film producers get started, uh, Film Hedge helps them finish. That's the their bookends. It's like one feeds the other. Um, do they always have to work together in the same deals? No. Uh, Southbox can do what it does for Film Hedge, for other debt financiers and uh, a lot of times films come to uh, Film Hedge already with all this stuff figured out. So they don't have to work together, but it's really great when they do. Yeah. Okay, one last question um, that, because it just, I have to ask it. So the, uh, because this is the thing, it, sound, it seems like to me that when, like when people say go to VCs, you can't just like knock on their front door. You've got to kind of have somebody that that walks you in. It seems like that would be the same thing with, you know, Netflix or Amazon or any of these ones that pre-buy that you you can't just like go knock on the door or Tyler Perry even, right? You've got to, they, they're they not, because it would be a gazillion people knocking on their well, door. Well, so hold how, on. I, I just want to clarify one thing for the viewers. So uh, no matter who, how big it is, like Tyler Perry, Steven Spielberg, like all those guys, they're producers. So they're the ones knocking. They're, they they have their own money to finance. But um, just that analogy of getting to the Netflixes and the Disneys and the Foxes, I wouldn't conflate that with the producers because the producers are just very wealthy people who sometimes finance film. The difference is Netflix only finances films or they acquire films. And, you know, so, uh, yes, it's true that it's hard to get to them. But they are in the business of delivering content. They need content. And so they're always on the hunt for content. A, a, a couple of other things that I wanted to add is um, uh, the reason why I built Film Hedge here in Georgia is because um, for a long time, Georgia was just, I called it cheap real estate for Hollywood. People would get, come from, people would uh, come from LA, New York, London. They bring their crews here, they make their movie, they get on a plane and go home. Mm -hmm. All the ideas were coming from elsewhere. All the work was being done here because it's cheap. And then they would go back. And so, um, you know, who's doing, who's making the decision making here? And the decision making is tied to the money. And so uh, the reason why I started uh, financing movies and, and with, uh, in 2018 uh, here in Georgia and then ultimately starting Film Hedge in 2020 was because I was trying to solve that problem. How do we keep the decision making here? And so now Film Hedge is, the fastest growing lender to Hollywood. We've raised over $100 million. We've deployed over $100 million uh, through our platform. And so uh, another thing I wanted to point out is we are a fintech company. We, Film Hedge is a tech company. So although we have a big line of credit to finance movies, all of that's happening on a platform where we're allocating, um, uh, where we're doing the underwriting, we're doing the analysis, we're deploying the capital through our platform. That's what makes us faster. It's what makes us uh, more competitive than uh, some of the existing players in the market. Uh, and we now originate over a billion dollars in uh, applicants for our money um, annually. Um, so our biggest problem now is we have all the deals from the best 
the names in Hollywood. We've been able to raise venture capital. Uh, we have been able to do 35 feature films, but we don't have enough money to meet the demand. And so now, even though we've, uh, we've raised $100 million of balance sheet money, we are still trying to grow that uh, pool of capital to about half a billion dollars because um, the demand is there, right? Like we, uh, the industry does not have an, as crazy as these numbers sound, the industry of Hollywood, uh, of film and TV does not have enough money to meet the demand of audiences for original content. And so that is what really? is making um, Film Hedge a very uh, uh, high growth, high value uh, tech company that will one day exit somewhere in Toledo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, you should, uh, we should, we should explore the, what, how Chicken Soup for the Soul raised their film fund, you know, with Reggae Plus sometime. Um, get a get a power to the people to to be able to own a piece of all of you of what you're doing. I, I, I'm glad you brought that up. So one last point, really quick. Um, we are uh, at Film Hedge. We are pioneering a new platform uh, later this month that will allow individual accredited investors to piggyback on our institutional loans to films. So we might at Film Hedge, you know, like normally they wouldn't take. Two fifty, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, or five hundred thousand dollars from a single investor because they don't need it. It might be a twenty million dollar movie; they don't care about half a million dollars. But um, because we're a senior lender and we might be putting in four million, ten million, twenty million into a film, uh, we've carved out a piece of every deal that we do for everyday uh, investors, accredited investors, mind you. So not people with a couple grand. But you got to have, you know, you got to meet the definition of a credit investor. But if you do, you now have access to deal flow to become that executive producer, to do that red carpet walk and to do it in a way knowing that um, you are safe as a lender. Like we have had zero defaults um, as lenders in this space. Uh, most lenders don't have defaults because of the way debt works in the film world. You're lending against a buy. You're not lending against we hope audiences come see this movie. Like we know Netflix is going to buy this movie. We're just sitting in between that trend. Yeah. So okay, great opportunity for people who want to invest or, or participate in this. Industry. Yeah. So go everybody listen, go to the show notes, filmhedge.com would be where they would go to learn more. But also uh, on a side note, John did a fascinating, he's very popular Ted talk and kind of coined this term uh, trickle down economics and it's a profound like oh thinking through your latest and greatest tech and how it's going to change and it's fairly kind of relevant in the ai space of the buzz that we have these days but the impact of of tech when it comes to the haves and the have nots and uh fascinating that link is also in the show notes i want to thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be a part of this today John, I really do appreciate you um, coming in to share your knowledge, your experience, and your journey with us. It's uh, been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, and uh, thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely.